All right, all right, all right. Let's get going. How's everybody? Fantastic. There's handouts up here if you need one. For We're starting a new section tonight, so come up, help yourself. What's up, buddy? All right. All right. A few announcements tonight before we start praying. Uh, just a reminder, this weekend is Easter Sunday. It's early this year. So um, there's some invite cards out there in the, in the connect area. There may be some over on that table too. These are for you to, to take and invite people. Uh, to hopefully start a spiritual conversation with people, you know. It's not, inviting people to church is awesome. We should do that, obviously. But the Great Commission is to go to where they are. And so we want to we make sure we do that. But maybe inviting them to church will open a spiritual conversation. We got our egg hunt this weekend right after service. Weather's looking pretty good, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, I think the door-to-door team's going out again this Saturday. Uh, one more time before Easter, if you want to help them out, they'll be here at 10, 10 a.m. here at the church, leaving at 10. So if you want to come go with them and help them with that, be here at 10 o'clock. They're uh, passing out invites to folks, new folks in our area. Um, also, this weekend on the 31st, we're collecting for Rehope again. We do that on the fifth Sunday of every, anytime we have a fifth Sunday. So uh, Rehope's a, an organization down in Harrisonville area that works with uh, women who've been rescued from human trafficking. And so there's a couple of bins out in the foyer that you can leave your stuff. There's a donation list, I think, available somewhere uh, out there as well. So make sure that uh, you bring those this Sunday so that uh, we can get those down to them. Uh, the Sunday after Easter, uh, April 7th, uh, we're going to be starting a new series called Big Faith. Uh, these are out in the Connect area as well. We're going to be making our way through Hebrews chapter 11, talking about uh, the Hall of Fame or the Hall of Faith. And so we're going to take a character a week and learn how we can grow in our faith as well. And so this, these are there for, again, for invites for people who you know that might not be churched that uh, you can have them to come with you. We've got, if you'd like to go through discipleship, on a one-on-one basis, have somebody take you through our D1 material. We've got a cost of discipleship class, which is the prerequisite for that, on the 14th of April. We've got several people signed up for that already, so make sure if you're planning to come to that, that you get signed up. We'll, we'll serve you lunch, and if you're in need of child care, we can probably work that out too. So please let us know if that's the case. Again, that's the 14th. And then baptisms. We're going to have another round of baptisms on the 28th of April. If you've been considering following Christ in baptism, make sure you get signed up for that baptism on the 28th of April. I don't see him here, but I just wanted to thank Greg for filling in for me last week while we were away out of town. I listened to some of that today. He did a great job, so praise the Lord for that. Appreciate him doing that for me. Uh, some prayers. Let's pray about some uh, Grace Baptist stuff. I want to I want to keep praying for Easter. I mentioned that already. Uh, it's a Sunday when uh, people that may not normally go to church will be in church. And so let's pray over that service. Ask God's Holy Spirit to be at work in hearts of people who need to, to trust Christ. And let's not only just pray for our church, let's pray for all church services that uh, God would be at work uh, this Easter and bring many souls into his kingdom. I want to continue to pray for community here at Grace. Praise the Lord. Uh, thank the Lord that he's, he's been building community here. I see that. I see uh, new relationships building. I know uh, that God's uh, involved in that. Only by his grace can we uh, uh, grow in our our fellowship with one another. And so we thank the Lord for that. But we want to continue to ask him to do that here at Grace. I also want to uh, pray over a few summer ministries. Uh, It's right around the corner, believe it or not. I know it doesn't feel like it today. A little chilly the last few days, but... Uh, we, we've got a busy calendar this summer. We've got VBS in June. Uh, we've got Summer Bible Club that'll start um, after VBS uh, on Wednesday nights when we're doing our Summer Bible Project here on Wednesday nights. And then our teen camp is mid-July. So lot, lots of stuff going on this summer. Summers are always really busy around here. And uh, we want to make sure that we're bathing all of that in prayer Uh, Because in the busyness of ministry, it's easy to lose focus, lose sight of why we're doing what we're doing. We get a little fatigued, and and, um, we can start going through the motions if we're not asking the Lord to help us through that. And then finally, if you would 
if you would mention uh, by name the, our men and women's ministries here at Grace, I'm just overjoyed at what God's doing through those, those ministries right now. It's just a blessing to see uh, the, the, um, the fellowship that's occurring, the prayer that's happening in those ministries, uh, the community that's being built, uh, just uh, prayer that's taking place. And so we got a lot of stuff on the horizon for those ministries as well. But I want to make sure we're praying that God will just continue to bless and be an encouragement to those, to those groups as we meet uh, together. So take some time, pal up with those around you, pray over those things, and I'll come back up and we'll do some missions.
Thank you, guys. All right. Missions. Guess what continent we're praying for tonight? South Africa. Antarctica. <laughs> we're trying to be obedient. We're praying for laborers in every field, so we'll, we're, we don't want to leave anybody out. So we're going to pray, pray over them this evening. Uh, I, I also want us to pray for uh, Brother Mong. I got, him, I got an email from him, uh, when was this, maybe a week ago. And so he said that uh, his son has made it to uh, India, and he's studying in a seminary there uh, through June. And so he asked that, you know, that that would go well for him. I get the impression it may be the first time he's kind of away by himself and has to cook for himself and all that kind of stuff. So those of you that have had kids make that transition or you made it yourself, you understand. Some of you would still starve to death if you had to move out and your wife wasn't cooking for you, but that's a different story for a different time. Also, um, he asked if, if we could pray that the Lord would provide for his tuition while he's there. Um, I think it's $80 a month, and so he's just asking God to, to provide that for him, and then that he would uh, do a work in him, and he would become a, a great servant of the Lord while he's there. He also asked if we would pray. He's got several preaching engagements that are coming up, and, and, and he asked for prayer for those. And he's going to be traveling by bus back, uh, back to Miramar. And uh, I guess the place where he's crossing, there's very intense fighting. And so he asked that we would pray as he makes that, that crossing uh, maybe mid-April when he's supposed to do that. So let's pray for him with those things. Uh, I see Amy over here with us, and we want to pray for the Hendricksmans tonight. I, I just was reading their uh, r most recent prayer letter today, and they're praying for laborers uh, to help them, join them in the ministry there, uh, specifically praying for a director for their school and also teachers for their school, and then uh, the finances for the third phase of their church building as well, which they're going to be starting pretty soon on the construction for that. And so... Let's pray for those things for them, if you would. And then I mentioned this already earlier, but let's, let's lift it up again in terms of missions. Let's pray for a fruitful Easter service for, for all those that are uh, laboring in the fields around North America, South America, and all over the world, even Antarctica. Let's, if they have an Easter service, let's pray that it's a fruitful one. And so let's lift those up uh, this evening and ask God to bring souls into his kingdom as a result of of the gospel being proclaimed on Easter Sunday. So lift those things up and we'll all come back. We'll pray and we'll get going with the study.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ and his shed blood on Calvary's cross. We thank you for the salvation that we have in him. We thank you for making it possible for us to be part of your family, to be reconciled to you through the finished work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we would walk worthy of, of the salvation that you've granted. I pray that we would be busy in service to you. I pray that our life would be focused completely upon what it is that you desire for us to do to further your kingdom. Lord, we pray that those around us in our circle of influence who do not know you as Savior would see your light sh shine in our life and that you would open doors for us to open our mouths so that we can declare your gospel to them. Father, we ask that you would use us to make disciples, to uh, help people grow in their faith, to help them uh, more completely give themselves over to following you. Uh, Lord, use this church and this ministry and use the individuals here to do that very work. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters around the globe that are laboring for you. We pray over them. We pray that you would encourage them. We pray that you would uh, give them the resources that they need, whether that's financial resources or human resources or supplies. Lord, just supply for every need. Uh, and Lord, bring glory to your name through that. Lord, we lift up uh, all those services around the world this weekend, we pray over them that your gospel would be preached and those who do not know you would come to know you as Savior. Uh, Lord, bring a great harvest for your kingdom this weekend. Lord, we ask that you would uh, please continue to uh, use and bless this church. Father, we pray for the missionaries that we support. We lift them up to you. I pray over Brother Mung. Uh, please uh, bless his son and help him in his new place and help him in his studies and uh, work in his heart, become more real to him. Be with, be with Brother Mung as he makes his way back and as he preaches your word. Encourage him through that. Lord, we lift up Joe and Amy to you. We pray over them and I pray for refreshing for Amy as she's here for a, a little bit in the United States. I pray for Joe and her as they labor in, in, in Oaxaca. Uh, give them the resources they need, Father. People to help and uh, just funds that are needed to complete construction and all of these things, Lord, you, you know the needs and you are more than capable of supplying and so we trust that you'll do that. Uh, Lord, we I wanna pray for uh, Mike as well, sure, as he's out on the road tonight and uh, this week and I, I, pr I know he's been having a few issues and I just pray for safety for him. Pray you would encourage him as he does your work. Uh, Lord, we, we lift up those in our body that are hurting. Uh, some are struggling with illness, some are uh, struggling with uh, relational issues. Some are, are maybe having financial issues. Lord, I pray we would be a blessing uh, as we find about, out about needs, that we would step up and, and bear one another's burdens, and we would lift each other up in prayer, and we would show the love of Christ to each other. Lord, please bless our study tonight. Bring glory to your name as we open your word together. Lord, challenge us, encourage us, convict us, uh, Lord, help us to see you in the pages of the stories that we're going to be talking about tonight. We love you and praise you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I hope everybody got a handout. If not, I got one left. All right. So we're entering a new section uh, tonight uh, called Three Kings Reigned. We're doing the big picture Bible study. We're going to be mostly in 1 Samuel, so if you want to be making your way to 1 Samuel, that's where, where we'll find ourselves most of the time tonight. And, and during this, uh, this section of the study to, uh, this week and then next week, we'll be uh, talking predominantly about uh, Saul, David, and Solomon, those three kings. We'll spend a little bit of time on Samuel tonight because he's kind of the precursor to those three. Uh, but this is a, a, an interesting time in the nation of Israel's history as they enter into the kings. Uh, it covers a sizable portion of the Old Testament. Uh, uh, first and, and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, are good portions of those books are, are dealing with those three characters. And of course, uh, 
many of the other poetry books, as they're called, uh, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, were written by uh, two of these three kings. And so uh, they're, they're responsible for a good portion of, of Scripture. But let's start with Samuel. Samuel, we talked about last time, was, is one of the last judges. In fact, I think he's the last judge that you know, we see in the book of Judges. But we'll, I'll show you a, a reference in a moment where he was, in fact, a judge. He's also uh, a prophet and, and functions and ministers in the role of a priest as well. But we see him, uh, f- uh, at least his parents, show up in the very first chapter of 1 Samuel. One of my favorite stories in, in, in the Samuels, there are many, uh, many great stories in First and Second Samuel, but this is the story of Hannah, who was barren and is pleading with God for a son. She's crying out to God. Uh, they're they're gathered. They're celebrating one of the feasts, and Hannah makes her way early to uh, the the temple or the tabernacle, where Eli, the high priest, sees her um, praying. Although he thinks she's drunk, uh, because she's. She, uh, praying kind of under her breath to the Lord, asking for a son. And then she lets him know uh, that she hasn't been drinking, but that she is, in fact, uh, sorrowful of spirit. In fact, look at verse 15. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. There's where she is. You know, man, just that last little phrase. That's, that's how you pray. You pour out your soul to the Lord. A lot of times we, uh, we get our little canned phrases that get on repeat, right? Our little Christianese sayings when we're praying. Bless this, bless that, direct them, guide them, all these things. And maybe we're saying it out of a genuine heart. I, I, I try my best not to judge people when they're praying. But if we can just get to the point where we're just an open book before the Lord. Lord, here it is in all its ugliness. <laughs> and this is what I need you to do. This is what I need help with. He knows what's going on anyway. <laughs> he sees right down into it. And so sometimes it's just about us coming to, re- to the recognition of what's going on in our own heart. And so he pours, pours out. Man, if I keep, uh, that's one verse I read and I'm already, <laughs> <laughs> we're never going to get through this study. It's all right. It'll all be okay, right? So look what it says, 17. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And so God obviously comes through for her. She does get the, the petition of her heart. God gives her a son, she names that son Samuel, and she has made a promise to dedicate him to the Lord. So once he's weaned uh, from her, she takes him t- uh, to uh, the, the uh, serve along uh, with Eli or underneath Eli in the tabernacle. And, and so he's, he's called as a child. In fact, look in uh, chapter 3, look at verse 4. He's been there a bit ministering. He's growing. The text calls him a child in verse 1, and the child Samuel, but in scriptural times, child could refer to anybody from infancy to adolescence, so it could be a pretty big range. So he's probably a little older at this point. And, and one night, um, God shows up and calls him, and it says in verse 4, and the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here am I. Now he thinks it's Eli that's calling him. And so he runs in to see what Eli wanted. And Eli's like, I didn't call you, go lay down. This happens several times. And finally, Eli, for all of his issues, at least he had some wisdom and says, this is the Lord talking to this young man. And so he tells him how to respond to the Lord. But I want you to see at a very young age, God's call is upon his life. You've heard me say this many times, God has a call for you. God has a call upon your life. Uh, it's, not an, it's not a function of age. It's not a function of marital status. It's not a function of gender. God has a calling upon your life. Your calling is different than my calling, is different than the person next to you's calling. But you have a calling of God. 
And our response, or, or our responsibility is to, uh, when that calling comes, here am I. I'm right here, ready to go, willing to listen, uh, desiring to be obedient to what it is that you desire for me to do. Uh, that's the place where all of us need to get to in our life. Uh, notice, notice in chapter 2, back up just a, a, maybe a page, chapter 2, look at verse 18. It says here that, uh, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, um, girded with a, a linen ephod. And so there he is from a, from a young man ministering bef- uh, before the Lord. And um, notice it's down in verse 21, look at the very end of that verse. And, and the child Samuel grew before the Lord. And so as he's ministering before the Lord, he's growing before the Lord. Did you know being involved in ministry helps you grow spiritually? You're never going to grow to maturity in your Christian faith by sitting and listening only. This is an important part of your spiritual life. But if you're not taking what you're getting and utilizing that in some way, pouring that into somebody else, or ministering before the Lord as as Samuel was, then that's going to stunt your spiritual growth. You've got to be using what God's giving to you. Notice uh, a little bit later, look in chapter 3 and, and verse 1 again. It says, and the, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And so a little different, right? Not ministering before the Lord, but ministering to the Lord. And, and I, I think what may be happening here is, is a transition that I see play out in a lot of young people's lives, and that is when uh, they're in church or ministering in church uh, before the Lord, and then all of a sudden there's a shift that takes place, and now they're doing it for the Lord, to the Lord. They're, the God that uh, maybe was their parents is now becoming their God. And so they're not so concerned as, oh, we go to church and we serve in church because that's what we do, or that's what my mom and dad says I should be doing. Now they're doing it, and it's not even about the church, it's about doing it for the Lord. And ultimately, that's, that's where we want to grow to, is where we're ministering to him. I, I, I don't know if you caught it or not it, in verse 1 as we read that, but it says, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days, right? There was no open vision. So that's an issue. There's no word from God. And that, that's related to a number of things, uh, at least in part due to the fact that uh, Eli, the priest, wasn't doing right, and his sons certainly weren't doing right. But notice, I want you to notice the contrast between Eli and Samuel here. Look, look in verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, look at this, and did let none of his words, God's words, the Lord's words, fall to the ground. See that? He, in other words, the, the word of God was precious to him. It, it was a rare thing, and God's starting to speak to this young man, and he's treating those words as precious. It's the same attitude we should have towards the word of God. Um, if, you, if you've ever been out of America and experienced different, a different culture and been involved in uh, evangelistic work or, or ministry work in that culture, I think, I think you would agree with, uh, the, uh, with the, the idea that they view God's word differently than we do. It is viewed with much more preciousness than we do. And I think, I think that is at least in part due to the fact that it's so accessible to us. We have so much, I mean, you go in my office, I bet you could probably scrounge up at least a dozen, maybe two dozen Bibles in my office. You know, some of them are ones I use. Some people give them to me. Some are study reference. I've got so many. And then, you know, I got it on my tablet. I got it on my phone. I got it on my computer. I've got, I've got it everywhere. But, and that, praise the Lord for that. I'm not diminishing that. I rejoice in that. But because it's so familiar to us and, and so common to us that we begin to take it for granted, don't we? This is the word of God given to you, given to me. And therefore, it might make a little sense if we spent some time reading it, thinking about it, 
memorizing it, studying it, getting God's perspective from his word. But because it's around all the time, we can, we can sometimes, and, and, and don't lie, because I know you've all been there, because I've been there. We've got to do that quiet time in the morning. We're like, all right, Lord, let's get this over with. We may not express that out loud, because I got stuff to do. I got important things to get to, right? As if connecting with God and hearing from the Lord is not the thing that might should be at the top of our priority list. And so I just want us to understand, we want to be like Samuel, where we don't let any of the words fall. We're, we're there. We're, we're ready to hear what God has for us. Uh, look with me in, in chapter 7, a little bit later in Samuel's life, a little bit later in his ministry. Uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 15 Here's where I told you I would give you the reference where he was a judge. It says in 15, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. And so... You can see that he, he was a judge of Israel, but also he had a regular circuit. He was a circuit preacher, I guess. He would make his way around the country to different uh, cities, and he would perform the judgments that needed to take place in that place. He would declare uh, God's wisdom in certain issues. And so I just wanted you to see his ministry wasn't just one of, hey, I'm, I'm there in the, in the temple, um, you know, helping with the offerings, all that kind of stuff. He was out and, and judging the people. He was a highly regarded a man of God amongst the people of Israel. Well, late in his life, look in chapter 8, look at verse 5. He's getting older. As we get older, our strength diminishes. Our effectiveness in certain ways uh, isn't what it used to be. I think Samuel's probably experiencing some of that. He's still a mighty man of God for sure. His, his sons are a problem. The ch children that he's had who are uh, his heir apparent to these, to these roles, uh, they're, they're not doing the right thing. And as a result of that, the, na the, the children of Israel, they, wanna, they want a king, right? Look, look at verse 5. And said unto him, said unto Samuel, the, the elders of Israel are saying this, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us, and this is the problem right here. Like all the nations. Israel wasn't supposed to be like all the nations. God, God was their king. God was their ruler. They were his people. They were to follow his commands. But uh, the, the, the children of Israel are looking around. And Samuel, as they said, is getting old. His children aren't doing the right thing. And they want a king like all the other nations nations and 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 Samuel is beside himself I mean he he he, he cannot look in six but the thing displeased Samuel he's upset he can't believe it I mean he's he's poured his life into serving the Lord and and serving these people and now they're like well, we don't, we don't want that anymore. We want a king like everybody else. Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Now look at this, seven. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And so God's counsel to Samuel is, I understand you're upset, but please understand, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And I think, I think for us, that's great advice in terms of our witnessing. When, when we share the gospel with someone, one of the things that holds us back from doing that is what? Fear of rejection, isn't it? Well, they're going to they're gonna say something, they might be mean to me, they might, they might ask me something I don't know, they might think less of me, and so the, the fear of rejection holds us back from saying something, and what we have to understand is what God told Samuel, 
They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. Their issue isn't with you. It's with him. And so we're, we're to just be a vessel that delivers the message that God has for us and not allow people's rejection of what we're saying uh, to become a personal thing, a personal attack on us. It, I, I know that's easier said than done, but we do need to take the counsel that God gives to Samuel in that respect. Now, God tells them to go ahead and, and anoint the king, but he also warns them. He also warns them about what kind of king they're going to get. You see this in chapter 8, uh, verse, uh, verse 9. Start there. He says, Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will, uh, this will be the manner of the king that will reign over you. He shall take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he shall appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them uh, to ear his ground and to uh, reap his harvest and to, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he shall take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep and he shall and, and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in the day because the, your king, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Look at the next verse. Nevertheless, the people refuse to obey. <laughs> oh my goodness. It shows us something about human nature, doesn't it? Don't be too hard on them. Yeah, we are. We're just like them. God tells us, don't do that. This is what's going to happen. You go that way. This is the consequence. Please don't do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You want to see? Yeah, sometimes worse than a teenager, for sure. Yeah, some lessons you have to learn the hard way. I get that. But the best way to gain wisdom is by learning from other people's mistakes. <laughs> That's the easiest way. But I want us to see it's just a... a, a, a it's a character study on our character. And God warns them. He says, this is the way it's going to be. And you're going you're gonna to get to the point where you're going to cry out to me. And I'm not listening. And so uh, they, they had to learn this lesson. So the king that they end up getting is King Saul. Let's look, let's look at him. King Saul. Let's first of all talk about his family. His family. Look with me in chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. He is the son of a man named Kish. K-I-S-H, 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And there was a man of, the, of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekothrath, the son of Aphia, a Benjaminite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. And so we see here a few things. Uh, Saul was the son of a man named Kish. Uh, and, and we see that Kish, it says, was a mighty man of power. So uh, the indication from that phrase is not only was he strong, but that he was a man of influence. He was an affluent individual. So uh, it's not. It's uh, it's likely that Saul grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was a um, a person from a, a, a child from an affluent family, and it says that he's from the tribe of Benjamin, which is important. If you, uh, uh, the tribe of Benjamin is a tribe of fighters. 
They were, they were uh, a fierce, they were fierce warriors. In fact, uh, the end of the book of Judges, if you read Judges chapter 20, you'll see uh, an indication of how powerful they were in, in warfare. Uh, the, the, virtually the entire nation of Israel comes against them because of some atrocities that have been committed in their tribe, and they whoop them. I mean, they send them, they send them packing. And so they, they're, they're intense fighters. Uh, that eventually Israel prevails and the Lord prevails against them. But they're, they're, they're a fighting bunch for sure. We also get some information in, in here in verse 2 about, about Saul. It says he was a, a choice young man. He was a catch. <laughs> goodlier, it says, than he's the goodliest in Israel. That just means he's good looking. He was an attractive man. He was a hottie, as we might say today. And so, and not only that, he's, he's, he looks the part, doesn't he? It says he's head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. So if you're, you know, if you've got, if you, if you kind of picture it as the tribes are all gathered there and everybody's kind of about the same height and all of a sudden, beep, whoa, hey, who was that guy, right? Yeah, you can picture that? You got that? It's not that difficult, right? The good looking part or the, the tall part? <laughs> I mean, the dude looked the part, right? Uh, tall, dark, and handsome. And he is, he, he I mean, if, if you saw him, you would think, oh, and he's from a tribe that's filled with fighters, right? These, these children of Benjamin, his dad's uh, a big deal. He's an affluent man. And, and so he, uh, without question, uh, should have been the choice, at least based on the way he looked. And he starts off okay in his reign, but man, it goes, it goes in the tank pretty quick. He, he, he ends up, he ends up, in fact, they should have, they should have known, we don't have time to look at it, but they should have known when they were uh, going to call him up to anoint him, he, he knows he's going to get picked and he goes and hides. <laughs> that might be your first indication this guy's not up to the task of being the king if he's, if he's hiding. Um, but I think we learn a valuable lesson for us spiritually, don't we? And that is that we shouldn't base things simply and solely upon how they look. I talked about this a few Sunday nights ago in, in our services that uh, God cautions us against judging things simply based upon appearance. Uh, the old phrase, right? You can't judge a book by the cover. But if, I mean, if you look just a little bit later, look in uh, 16, chapter 16, look at verse 7. At this point, God's done with Saul. He's sending Samuel to anoint uh, David as king. And, and Samuel's struggling with picking which of the sons of Jesse is going to be the king. He's starting to bring him out in age order, as you would. And David's older brothers look the part. Oh, yeah, another good-looking guy who looks like a king. And, the, and God has to step in. Look what he says in verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. There it is, right there. That's, that's the principle. Now, you can be tall and a nice-looking guy uh, and, and have a heart for the Lord, for sure. It doesn't exclude you from that. Or you can, you know, be, be a small person and, and homely. And God can use you mightily. I think Sunday, that Sunday night when we talked about this concept, I read you a historical description of the Apostle Paul. And, and he was described as a short, bow-legged man with a unibrow and a hook nose. That's how he was described in some historical documents. Yet he was, he was in tune with the Lord. And so um, we, we learn from, from Saul that we can't do that. Now, uh, Saul's family, look in, look in chapter 14, 1 Samuel 14. Look at, the, uh, look at the 49th verse of that chapter right towards the end. It says, now the sons of Saul were Jonathan and Ishua and Melchishua, and the names of two daughters were these, the name of the firstborn, Merab, in the name of the younger Michael. And so we see he has 
In that list, he has one, two, three, four, five children. There's another son mentioned in 1 Chronicles 8.33, Abinadab. And so uh, that must have been a child that was born later. Abinadab uh, is also a son. And so he had, he had four sons and two daughters. Now, the, the, the two most famous of his children are without question Jonathan. And Jonathan, I love Jonathan. He's, he's such a great character in Scripture. Uh, and, and Jonathan became David's best friend. Look in, look in 18, 1 Samuel 18. It says, and it, and it came to pass when he made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him uh, go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe and was upon him and gave it unto David and his garments even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. And so we see here that not only did he love David, but he made a covenant with David. He knew David was going to be the next king. He knew God was done with his dad and he was pre pledging his allegiance to, to David. And they had an unbelievable relationship. In fact, uh, keep your place kind of here in 1 Samuel, but flip back one more book to 2 Samuel chapter 1. So here, this is David um, speaking. He says, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. He's, he's heard uh, Jonathan's died. Very, ple what's that? 26. First Samuel 1, 26, sorry. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. I think, I think this is instructive for us, um, and it shows us, you know, we need people in our life that are friends that are so dear to us and close to us, and that help us in our walk with the Lord. You know, to be, you should never be closer with anyone than you are with your spouse if you're here and you're married. But we also need relationships with uh, people of the same gender, that surpasses the love of women or surpasses the love of men if you're a lady. And so, because there's, there's a commonality there, but we need people in our life that'll challenge us, that'll propel us to, to new heights in our walk. You need, you need that type of connection. That, that's, uh, you know, the sense of the theme this year here at Grace is that building of community. It's, it's, it's not, it, it goes beyond, uh, um, you know, let's have a dinner group every once in a while and get to know a few new people. This is about developing godly relationships with people in your life that are that that you know see, can see the ugly and still love you. You know that can pray you through a struggle when you need prayer. That'll call you out and say, "No, that's not right. You need to you need to change that. You, you need that that type of a person in your life." Jonathan was that with David. Uh, Michael or uh, Michelle, however you pronounce that, that was uh, Saul's youngest daughter. Uh, she ends up becoming the wife of David, um, kind of a, as a manipulative thing in, in chapter 18. Uh, her dad hears that she likes David and he kind of likes her and he hooks that up, hooks them together uh, with, with the hopes of uh, controlling David. Um, uh, she's an interesting character because she, she ends up, at the beginning at, when we read about her, she's supportive and helping David. Later on, she's remarried another person, and when David comes back into power, uh, she's not supportive at all of him. We see Saul anointed by Samuel in chapter 10, chapter 10 and verse 1. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is not, 
Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? And so here we see Samuel anointing Saul as the first king of Israel. Uh, and I said, he, out of the gate he does okay. But then, then the true person, I think, starts to shine forth. He, he, is, he is a person of poor leadership and it has got some f- fatal flaws. So let's, let's kind of make our way through some of these. Look in chapter 13. Chapter 13, look at, uh, look at verse 19. It says, now there was no smith, like a blacksmith. That doesn't mean like the Smith family. It's like a blacksmith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen everyone his, his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. So if they had a, a farming tool that they needed sharpened, they had to go down to the Philistines to get it sharpened because there weren't any blacksmiths. They got rid of all the blacksmiths in Israel. Verse 21, yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulter and for the uh, forks and for the axes to sharpen the goads, 22. So it came to pass in the day of battle, so they're getting ready to go to war, that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan, his son was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Mish. Mash. I always find that interesting. Where did how come Saul and Jonathan got a sword? Where'd they get those? How come nobody else had any? There are some out there with a pitchfork, right? Getting ready to go to battle. They've got a goad <laughs> that I use to goad my sheep and oxen. If I'm if I'm really good, I got an axe. But these guys got Got weapons? How come nobody else had a weapon? <laughs> exactly right. But he wasn't prepared. He made sure he was taken care of, but nobody else had anything. Him and his son were okay, but not the rest of them. Look in chapter 14. Now it came to pass upon the day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. And, and Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And so I want you to notice the contrast between Jonathan and Saul. Jonathan's like, hey, come with me. We're going over there. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take care of this. If you read the rest of the chapter, you can see he's trusting the Lord. Hey, it's, the Lord can deliver by few or by many, he says. And we're going to go fight because it's not us fighting, it's the Lord. But notice Saul. It says he's in the, uh, I like the way it says it, the uttermost part of Gideon. That means he's in the back, sitting under a pomegranate tree. I love pomegranates. He's munching on some pomegranate in the shade, just waiting for, Everybody else to die <laughs> with their goads and pitchforks out there fighting. Not a person of high character. Not really inspiring anyone, is he? For sure. Look in chapter 14, look a little later. If you, if you read the, the rest of the story, Jonathan goes over and just starts slaying. You know, he's up there fighting by himself and there's just Philistines falling in his wake. And so suddenly everybody's like, hey, what's going on? Who's over there? Who's missing? Oh, it's Jonathan. And then they start to come in his wake and, and fight and pursue the Philistines. But, but we see, if you, read, if you read the rest of chapter 14, it, it says that, and look at verse 24, and the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, cursed be the man that eateth any food until even evening, that I may be avenged of mine enemies, so none of the people tasted any food. So he's like, nobody's eating until we've conquered the Philistines. And it says there that they're, they're distressed, they're, they're, they're in fear. Saul was a bully. He was leading by fear. You guys can't eat anything 
until you finish fighting. And they're at it for days and days and days. They're, they're, they're pursuing their enemy. So they're, they're not just walking. They're probably running a lot of the time and fighting. And, and, and that's taken a lot out of them. They, if, they would just, if you would just let them stop and eat, then they'd be better prepared to fight the battle. But he's leading by fear. He doesn't want them to do that. And it ends up that he causes them to fall into sin. Look at verse 32. And the people flew upon the spoil. So after they... They, they captured this city. Look at verse 31. Look at the last, the last two words. And the pe- or it says, and the people were very faint. See that? They're about to pass out or die because of famine, because of food. And the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and, blo- and oxen and calves and slew them and, and to the ground. And the people did eat them with the blood. See that? I mean, they're so hungry that they start eating raw meat. And that's against the law. It was against the Jewish law to do that. They couldn't eat it with the blood. And so his leadership and uh, leading by fear is actually pushing people toward sinfulness. He calls them, and, and, and then he, he goes on this diatribe about uh, who ate because Jonathan didn't hear his commandment and ate some honey, which is a great story in and of itself. And his eyes are enlightened, it says. And Jonathan can't believe his dad is not letting the people eat and so it, it, it comes to the past where Jonathan, I'm sorry, where Saul finds out that Jonathan has eaten and disobeyed his rules, and he's going to kill him. He's going to kill him right out there in front of everybody. And the people step in. Look at verse 45, I think it is. And the people said, shall, uh, said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid. As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan that he died not. I think here's uh, Saul starting to, starting to lose the respect of his people. He's making stupid choices. You're going to kill the guy who just won us the battle? Are you crazy? God forbid. That's not going to happen. And they rescue him from his own father from uh from Saul and 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 he's losing respect Uh, let's look at another place look in uh chapter 18 remember in the passage where where Samuel warns Israel about what kind of king they were going to get and it kept saying he's going to take your sons he's going to take your daughters well he's he's gleaning all the very best and most powerful and most fierce warriors to himself and surrounding him with them and one of the people that comes into his court is, is David. And he, he, he's not there very long before um, he starts, it starts to be shown to Saul that God's with him and doing great things through him. And, and Saul becomes jealous and afraid of David. Chapter 18, look at 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, David was obedient, and behaved himself wisely, and Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Say that a bunch of times fast, in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass, as they, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the, that the women came out of all the cities uh, of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with uh, tabrets, with joy and with instruments of music. And the woman answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Somebody's getting more credit, right? And Saul was very wroth. And and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands and to me they have ascribed but thousands. What can he have more than than the kingdom, and saw I David from that day forward. And so we can see he's jealous, isn't he? He's afraid of David. And it shows us what a bad leader he is. It really does. If, if you're a leader that's all the time worried that somebody's going to get more credit than you're getting, you're a bad leader. You, you, you need to want the people that are under you to succeed. When they do good, you do good. When they're successful, you're successful. You can't, if, you, if, if people, if you spend all your time worrying about who's getting what credit, you're going to end up like Saul did, just a, a jealous and afraid. 
He's, he's inconsistent, he's compromising, he lacks integrity and discipline in his life, and he's impulsive. He's just led around by his emotions all the time. I mean, he tries to stick David to a wall with a javelin multiple times. That's pretty out there. He's rejected by God. And, 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 and I think if there's a lesson, you say, if, if you ask me, hey, Brad, what's the, what's the chief lesson we can learn from Saul? I think this is probably it. He, he's rejected by God, but the reason God rejects him, I think, is instructive for us, and it's disobedience. He's disobedient to what God asks him to do. Let's look at at least one of these. Look in uh, chapter 13, 1 Samuel 13. First Samuel 13, let's start in verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel, that's the he in that verse is Saul. So Samuel had told him to wait for, for seven days. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So he's starting to lose control of the people that are there with him. Okay, They're starting to f- scatter. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Now, Saul was not a priest. He was the king. He was not supposed to do that. Here's a great principle. He's doing a good thing the wrong way. Okay? Should we offer offerings to the Lord? Yes. Is, this, is he doing it the way God told him to? No. This isn't pragmatism. The end, the end doesn't justify the means. God wanted him to do it a certain way, and he needed to be obedient to that, but he's not. Even though he's doing a good thing, he's not doing it the right way. 10, and it came to pass as soon as he had made the end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, and he, that he might salute him. Oh, isn't that the way it works? As soon as he's like, well, I guess he's not coming. I better just do what I want to do. As soon as he took that step, he shows up. Learn the lesson. We're waiting on the Lord he told him, I'll be there in the seventh day. He's not there. He didn't want to wait. Things are getting out of hand. People are starting to scatter. I better take matter into my own hands instead of waiting on the, prophet, the man of God and what God wanted. And as soon as he's disobedient, he shows up. We've got to wait. We've got to be patient. We've got to trust in the Lord. And notice, notice he goes out to meet him. Why do you think he did that? He didn't want to, want to see the offering, right? Oh, <laughs> run out there. And say, oh, the guys are just making some hot dogs over there. That's just not an offering. They just, you know, s'mores. Everybody likes s'mores. <laughs> Look what Samuel says, verse 11. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? He knew. And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Mishmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal and I have not made uh, supplication unto the Lord. Look at, it, look at this. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. He's so full of it. He immediately starts pointing fingers, doesn't he? Well, the people were starting to scatter, and you, you didn't show up when you said you would be here, and the Philistines might attack. He's, he's deflecting. You know, I think he'd have been okay if he said, man, I screwed up. I did the wrong thing. I got ahead of you. I, I didn't trust you. I did something I shouldn't have done. Please forgive me. I repent. I think he'd have been okay, but he doesn't do that. He starts pointing fingers and making excuses for his disobedience, trying to justify his sinful behavior. Learn the lesson. We can do the same thing. Well, this happened, and they did that, and they said, well, they hit me first. You know, it's just this, it's just this thing that we got where we want to do this. Them, 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 them. Look over there. And so Samuel is calling him out for this. And he says, I force myself. And Samuel said to Saul, 
thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would have the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. He says, listen, God would have taken care of you. But now the kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. That's David. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Again, it's his disobedience. In your notes, there's a couple of other ones, the Amalekites. He's told to, to go in and, 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 and conquer them and, and get rid of all, all of them and all of their stuff. And he doesn't do it. You, re, you can read it on your own. It's the same thing. He's saying, well, I, he keeps the king alive, Agag, which if you read the book of Esther, Haman is an Agite, an Agite. He comes from that king. And he says, well, I kept the best stuff because I was going to offer it to the Lord. We kept all the good animals because we wanted to give an offering to the Lord. That's not what God said. God said, wipe them out. I don't want them. But he's trying to justify again. Uh, one other thing, and, and I, we're out of time, so let me just finish with this. And you, you can read this on your own. Another big uh, thing with him is uh, his encounter with the witch at Endor in 1 Samuel chapter 28. He is so far gone, and God is not talking to him. He's pleading for guidance from the Lord, and God is not answering them. You see that in 1 Samuel 28, 6. That he goes to a, a witch to have her summon up Samuel from the dead to, so he can talk with Samuel. And, and listen, she does it. She does it. So what's, my, what's my comment to us? I know a lot of the stuff that goes on in that kind of spiritism world, uh, palm reading and uh, cards and... Uh, horoscopes, and all, I know a lot of that's just hooey. It, it really is. It's, it's con artists taking advantage of people. But some of it's real. And better to not get up close to that line and start messing with stuff you ought not to be messing with. She calls Samuel up. And, and Saul has a conversation with him and it doesn't go the way Saul hoped it would. <laughs> he says, you're going to die. <laughs> God's done with you. And he tells him that in verses 16 to 19. And, and, and he, he really is a, a, a tragic case. He really is. You see in your notes how his life ends in 1 Samuel 31. He, he's killed him. He takes his own life. And it's just a, a, a tragic end to a tragic life. A person that was filled with potential that God could have used mightily for his honor and glory. And because of his bad choices, um, he ends up out of fellowship with God, losing his kingdom, losing virtually um, a good portion of his family and, and certainly his, his reign. So uh, he, he's, he's the downside. Next time we'll, we'll, we'll hit David and Solomon, and they're, they're a little more uplifting, at least most of They got flaws just like all of us, right? Uh, but uh, we'll do that next time. Let's pray and we'll be done. Father, we love you. Thank you for Christ. Appreciate the chance to be here tonight. Pray you're glorified through the things that were said. Lord, we, we pray that we would, unlike Saul, be obedient. We pray that we would uh, heed your warnings in our life. We would take uh, our call, your call upon our life seriously, and we would strive to live for you and follow you fully and completely. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.